when Nobel Prize winning physicist Roger Penrose realized in 1969 that energy could be extracted from black holes. He likely did not foresee that his discovery would evolve into the idea of a black hole bomb just a few years later in 1972. Just like Otto Hahn, who in 1938 discovered that splitting the atom could release unimaginable amounts of power, but could never have imagined it would one day be turned into a devastating weapon. Shortly after Penrose's breakthrough, in 1971, Russian physicist Delzovich discovered that when an electromagnetic wave strikes a rotating metallic cylinder, rotating at the same frequency as the wave, it doesn't get absorbed. Instead, it amplifies and reflects back even stronger. At that moment, the final theoretical groundwork for the black hole bomb was complete. The idea of a black hole bomb was first proposed in 1972 by American physicists William H. Press and Saul Tukolsky from Caltech. For more than half a century, it remained purely theoretical. Until now, in April 2025, a team of physicists from the University of Southampton, England, announced in a peer-reviewed journal that they had successfully recreated this phenomenon in a laboratory, an idea once confined to equations and thought experiments, had at last become an observable reality. Of course, the scientists weren't trying to build a bomb. They were trying to understand the nature of black holes. But if you know anything about humanity's history with weapons, you know it probably won't stop there. Now, here's what you need to know. You don't actually need a real black hole to build a black hole bomb. But you do need something that behaves like one. That means you control the energy and the explosion. The idea sounds simple. But let's begin at the beginning with a paper from 1972. Picture yourself in deep space, hovering just beyond the event horizon of a massive black hole. Far enough not to be pulled in, but close enough to feel its gravity and its spin. Now, imagine placing a perfect mirror in front of that black hole. A mirror designed to reflect every kind of wave the black hole emits. What happens next? Waves that might have escaped the black hole bounce back. In return, amplified, right toward the black hole again. In the second stage, we introduce a low-frequency electromagnetic wave into the system. The wave travels toward the black hole and enters a region known as the ergosphere. This is the zone between the black hole's event horizon and the area where its rotational energy dominates. In other words, anything that falls into the ergosphere is split. Part of it is pulled into the black hole, and part of it is violently flung outward, accelerated by the black hole's insane rotational speed. To put it into perspective, at the center of our galaxy, the rotational drag inside the ergosphere of its supermassive black hole is estimated to spin space itself at around 179,000 kilometers per second. If the wave we send in is rotating in the same direction as the black hole spin, the black hole won't absorb it. Instead, it uses some of its own rotational energy to amplify the wave and hurl it back. Scientists call this process superradiance. And here's the kicker. Superradiance doesn't just happen around black holes. Theoretically, it can occur around any rotating object. That was exactly the idea proposed by Zeldovic in the early 1970s using a spinning metallic cylinder. And that's the very concept that inspired the design behind the recent experiment. Now the third stage. The amplified wave hits the reflective mirror and is redirected back toward the black hole. And once again, superradiance happens. Each time the cycle repeats, the wave grows stronger. This is a positive feedback loop, a system that reinforces itself by feeding on its own output. It's just like a nuclear chain reaction. Once power is triggered, it grows exponentially. So, how much energy can a black hole bomb actually produce? Some theories suggest the energy could double with every cycle, a full 100% increase each time. But let's stay conservative. Let's assume just 50% feedback. So we begin with one single unit of energy, and we let it cycle again and again. By the 10th return, we've reached 57 times the energy we started with. 50. Seven times. That's the power of exponential feedback. And if such growth continues unchecked, you're no longer controlling the energy. The energy is controlling you. In the fourth stage, we begin to see that the energy increase isn't infinite. Because the wave grows stronger with every cycle, the system eventually reaches a point where it becomes overloaded, filled with more power than it can contain. That accumulated energy either leaks outward 
or releases in a massive explosion. At this moment, theoretically, a black hole bomb is formed, a device in space physics that amplifies its own energy and eventually explodes. Let's put this into perspective. We start with just one kilojoule of energy, that's roughly 1 47th of an iPhone battery's energy. After 50 cycles, the total energy reaches the equivalent of 150 tons of TNT. For comparison, the atomic bomb the Americans dropped on Japan, Little Boy, released energy equal to 15,000 tons of TNT. So, how did a university in England manage to recreate this effect in a lab? To replicate the core mechanism of the black hole bomb, the Zeldovic effect, which causes an electromagnetic wave to grow stronger upon return. The researchers began with a conductive aluminum cylinder that was capable of rotating on its axis. This cylinder was placed inside a setup where it could interact with an externally generated rotating magnetic field. You can think of this configuration as the electromagnetic analog of a black hole's ergosphere. Next, the metal cylinder, which will be set into motion, was wrapped with three layers of copper coils. However, a physical gap was intentionally left between the aluminum cylinder and the copper windings. Copper was chosen specifically because of its high conductivity and low energy loss. Additionally, RLC circuits were embedded within each layer of copper windings. These circuits were necessary to carry and regulate the current required to generate the rotating magnetic field. So, at the heart of the system is an aluminum cylinder surrounded by three layers of copper and inside those copper layers are embedded RLC circuits. In the next stage, the aluminum cylinder was set into motion using an external mechanical motor. However, the copper coils themselves remained stationary. At the same time, a controlled electromagnetic field was generated around the system by sending electrical current through the copper coils. In other words, the setup now had two synchronized components, a physically rotating metal cylinder and a rotating magnetic field produced by the coils. Once the cylinder began spinning and the coil started generating a magnetic field, a critical threshold was carefully monitored within the apparatus. And then, the expected phenomenon occurred. The moment the rotational speed of the cylinder exceeded the rotation rate of the magnetic field generated by the coils, the system exhibited the long-anticipated effect, superradiance. In this moment, a weak electromagnetic signal passing through the coils drew energy from the rotation of the cylinder and returned amplified with more energy than it had initially. This, essentially, is the exact process that forms the theoretical foundation of the black hole bomb. In the laboratory setup, the aluminum cylinder plays the role of the black hole, and the electromagnetic field created by the stationary copper coils represents the incoming wave. Through this interaction, the researchers were able to make this theoretical process observable on Earth for the very first time. At this point, the scientists wanted to explore whether the system could function without any external input signals. In other words, could the system still generate effects if no signal was sent into the coils? In this experiment, with no external current supplied to the coils, they observed that, after a short while, an electromagnetic signal began to emerge spontaneously from within the coils. As the process continued under these conditions, the signal grew exponentially. Energy began to accumulate in the coils, until eventually the resistive elements could no longer handle the load. They burned out, halting the system. In other words, the theoretical version of a black hole bomb's explosion had manifested in the lab as the system's physical components reaching their operational limits. And for those wondering, yes, throughout this entire process, the researchers closely monitored the signal using a high-sensitivity oscilloscope placed right beside the coils. This device, which visualizes electrical signals along a time axis, allowed the team to record the signal's amplitude and frequency step by step in real time. The data collected showed a high degree of agreement with theoretical predictions, and it confirmed that the process truly followed the principle of superradiance and aligned with the black hole bomb concept. When we examine the data obtained from the experiment, we see something remarkable. The scientists started the system with extremely low energy input. So low, in fact, that the signal they injected was even weaker than an ordinary radio wave. When this weak electromagnetic signal was delivered into the coils, the rotating cylinder inside the apparatus didn't absorb it. Instead, it returned the signal, 
amplify by drawing on some of its own rotational energy. And then something extraordinary happened. With each cycle, the returning signal grew stronger and stronger. According to measurements in some tests, the energy returned by the system was up to 10 times greater than the input signal. In essence, this setup behaved like an energy amplifier, starting with a tiny input and producing a rapidly growing, eventually uncontrollable energy output. This behavior is considered the experimental counterpart of the black hole bomb theory. Extracting massive energy through rotation, with almost nothing fed into the system from the outside. From what we see in the paper, it appears that the researchers did not take into account the energy given to the motor. In this experiment, they only analyzed how much energy the electromagnetic system itself received and returned, meaning the input signal sent to the coils. Their goal was to test whether a rotating system, much like a black hole, could transfer energy to particles from its own rotation. And one of the most significant findings the researchers arrived at was this. A black hole, under the right conditions, can indeed transfer energy to particles using its rotational motion. In other words, the long-debated idea of extracting energy from a black hole for the first time has been directly observed and validated in a laboratory setting. Let us also add this small but important note. If sufficiently strong and lossless materials are used, the system's potential for exponential energy growth could eventually compensate not only for the electromagnetic input signal, but also for the energy required to power the motor spinning the cylinder. And most likely, it could produce far more energy than what was originally invested. Now, even though the laboratory version of the black hole bomb is not in itself a weapon, the core idea behind it, starting with a small amount of energy and exponentially drawing more from a rotating structure, could, in the future, be adapted into technologies such as directed energy weapons or high-power electromagnetic systems. In fact, let's be honest, it will be adapted, just like with a nuclear bomb. Let's hope this new discovery is used not for weaponry, but to help solve our global energy problems. Although I'd rather not sound pessimistic, it's not exactly encouraging that even though the first fusion bomb was created back in 1950, we still haven't harnessed fusion energy for peaceful use. If you enjoy our videos, share them, comment, and support us so that we can reach even more people. Because science is what we do.